Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for our Bible study again tonight. I praise the name of the Lord that you are faithful to the Lord and you're always there. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for this period, a period of concentrated study, paying attention to your word. Lord, we love you. We appreciate the fact that you are speaking to us and teaching us every time. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the death of Christ for us, the love of Christ for us, and everything he has done for us so that we can be with him, we can be with you in glory eventually. We're asking, Lord, tonight you open our eyes of understanding that we'll behold the real truth and the impact of the word will be in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking that tonight you give us maximum rapt attention so we're not distracted by this or this or calls or any other thing, but we listen to you as if we were in the sanctuary in the auditorium. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we're coming to chapter 15 of Mark. And we're looking at the death of Christ and the burial of Christ according to the scriptures. Yes, you know he was arrested. You know that he was betrayed. You know that he was judged unrighteously. And you know that he was eventually crucified. And he died. And he was buried. And of course, he rose again the third day. Tonight, we are concentrating on Christ's death and burial according to the scriptures. We're reading from Mark chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 42. Mark chapter 15. Please open your Bible. Thank you. God bless you. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And now, when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, that will mean on Friday, then we're told in verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and created the body of Jesus. And then he tells us in the next verse, it says, And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And then it says in verse 45, And when he knew each of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. In verse 46, it says, And he bought fine linen and took him down, that is down from the cross, and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher in the tomb, which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone onto the door of the sepulcher. Now the last verse, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. That's the simple story. There are three points we're looking at as we consider this, um, this study today. Number one, the vicarious death of Christ Jesus. That word vicarious, I'm sure you understand. It means the substitutionary death. What he did for another, what he did for you, for me, and for the whole world. The vicarious death of Christ Jesus. Point number two, the virtuous deeds of the counselor Joseph. That counselor Joseph of Arimathea, he did something at this particular time which was a kind of virtuous. What the disciples themselves will not even attempt to do because they were afraid. But we we'll see the deeds of the counselor Joseph. Number three, the valiant discipleship of the Christian justified. God wants us to be valiant. He wants us uh, to do deeds that will glorify the Lord and honor the Lord. The valiant 
discipleship of the Christian justified. We're looking at point number one. In point number one, we're coming back to Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 45. It's talking about his death. It's talking about the death of Christ, the death of our Savior, the death of our Redeemer, and it's a substitutionary death. There are these three things we're looking at here. Number one, the substitutionary death of Christ. Number two, the sanctifying death of Christ. Point number three there is the smashing death of Christ. That means that when Christ died, he smashed the devil. He conquered the devil. He destroyed the power of Satan on earth and in any life that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the smashing death of Christ. Let's come to number one. As we look at number one, the substitutionary death of Christ. We're looking at Mark again, Mark chapter 15. And in Mark chapter 15, look at here from verse 42. And now, when the evil was come, because it was preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, the Jewish people, they wanted everything to be clear of work, of activity, of occupation on the Sabbath day. And because it was the preparation for the Sabbath, that means Friday, a day to prepare for the Sabbath rest. That's why they wanted to make sure that everyone on the cross, if they were not dead, they will kill them. They will club them and break their bones. But in the case of Jesus, look at verse 43. In verse 43, it says, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and he went boldly unto Pilate and created the body and demanded the body and asked for the body of Jesus. And then now in verse 44, it says, and Pilate marveled if he were already dead. He marveled he were, if he were already dead. Because you see, there were people that could spend days on the cross dying slowly until they eventually died. But in the case of the Lord Jesus, you remember his final watch on the cross when he said, Father, into thy hand, I commit my spirit, I commend my spirit, and then he gave up the ghost, he died. And Pilate marveled, if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And there was a confirmation. Yes, he had died. But what kind of death? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, looking at verse 3, it's talking about the gospel that Paul the apostle had preached unto the Corinthians. And the elements of the gospel there is the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. And this is the reason why it was done. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. He didn't die for himself. He wasn't a sinner. He was pure. It was perfect, it was holy, it was godly, it was righteous, it was spotless, sinless, and he had no fault. It was faultless. Pilate himself said, Herod also said, I find no fault in him. He died. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. Look at this again, according to the scriptures. It's a fact. It's the truth. And it is recorded in the word of God according to the scriptures. But why did he die? Already I told you from that verse 3 that he died for our sins. But the scripture had prophesied that. That's why it says, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. Which scriptures? In Isaiah chapter 53, we're looking at verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53, we're looking at verse 6. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. That means we have transgressed. Transgressing means we have gone astray, we have crossed the mark, we have not done the right thing. 
is short, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one his own way. We have not turned to the way of God. We have not walked in the narrow way. We have not done the will of God. We have been self-willed. We have been sinful. And we have made ourselves idols, making ourselves God to ourselves. And we didn't go the way of God because we wanted to go our own way. Everyone turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. This is why he died, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in verse 8, in verse 8, it tells us he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. That's death. That's death. He died. He was cut off out of the land of the living. But why? For the transgression of my people was he tricky. It wasn't for himself. It was a substitutionary death. That's why we're told in Romans chapter 5, looking at verse 8. Romans chapter 5, we're looking at verse 8, now telling us the reason for that death. And the substitution he made for us, but God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Substitutionary. Christ died for us. In verse 9, it affirms in verse 9 much more than being now justified by his blood. We are justified not by the good deeds we have done. We are justified not by the moral life we have lived. We are justified because of his blood. It says we shall be saved from wrath through him. The wrath of God, the judgment of God, the indignation of God, the punishment that should have come from heaven, from God, because of our sins, Christ bore everything. We are saved from the wrath through him. And he tells us in verse 10, in verse 10 he says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Very significant. By the death of of his son. You know, it's not just the pure life that Jesus lived that qualified him to be our substitute because he had no sin of his own to pay for. He had no sin of his own to die for. But then that death of an innocent lamb, that death of a pure lamb, that death of a blemished lamb of God made substitution for us and then it says we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. In fact, it says in verse 11, in verse 11 it says, and not only so, but we also joy and rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now, we have now received the atonement, image atonement for us. And because of that, we can have salvation. We can have adoption into the family of God. We can have reconciliation with God. All guilt gone, all condemnation gone, because God does not impute our sin unto us anymore. He imputes the righteousness of Christ unto us. The atonement has been made. And the moment you turn, the moment you repent, the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's done in a moment of time, and heaven will rejoice because of you. The moment you give your life to the Lord and you say, Lord, here am I. I give myself to you. I know Christ died for me. I know I will not bear the punishment anymore. I will not bear the condemnation anymore. I will not bear the eternal wrath of God anymore because Christ bought that for me. He is my substitutionary sacrifice. At that very time, you now receive the atonement. But not only that, not only that he forgives us because of his death. He sets us free. 
He cleanses us. He purifies us. Look at the second point here. The sanctifying death of Christ. The sanctifying death of Christ. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus our Savior, but we see Jesus, our Sanctifier, but we see Jesus, our Redeemer, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He became a human being. He became man so that he will suffer the suffering of death. Angels could not die, and so he didn't take the nature of angels. He took our nature, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now he is crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, underline this in your Bible, should taste death for every man. Should taste death for every man. You see, the sacrifice of Jesus, the death of Jesus, was not a partial substitution. It's not only for the Jews. It's not only for the Gentiles. It's not only for the whites. It's not only for the blacks. It's not only for the brown. It's not only for the aged. And it's not only for the children. It's for everyone. He tasted death. For every man. Why? Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it tells us, For it became him. That means he befitted him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And look at that verse. It says, it for whom are all things, all things belong to him. And by whom are all things, he made all things. And yet, in his glory, that glorified Christ, that great Christ, and that incomparable Christ, and that unique Christ, unparalleled, unequaled, above all created beings, he forsook all. He made himself of no reputation. And he came to this world to suffer. Why? To die. Why? And to go through all the wrath and all the punishment is to bring many sons to glory. Is to get you out of disgrace, out of sin, out of degradation, out of your shame, out of your sin. And to bring you to God, reconcile you to God and bring as many as will believe on him, bring them to glory, to make the captain of their salvation. He is the origin of our salvation. He is the founder of our salvation. He is the giver of our salvation. He is the perfecter of our salvation. He is the finisher of our salvation. And he got all that, the ability to be our substitute, through suffering. Look at verse 11 now. It says in verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. He is the one that sanctifies by his death, by his blood. And he cleanses us and he purges us and he makes us free in the inner man. And it makes us clean in the inner man. And it makes us holy in the inner man. In our very nature, it turns everything around and it makes us new. And it says, he who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. He brings us to himself and we're united with him. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. He now calls us Brethren, in fact, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. It says, for by one offering, that's by one sacrifice, by that one death on the cross of Calvary, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. There is salvation 
and it's through the death and the blood of Jesus Christ. There is sanctification. It's through the death, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 15 there. In verse 15 it says, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after he had said before, verse 16 now, what did he say? He said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. It's telling us now the experience we have and the divine touch we have, the divine transformation we have at the point of sanctification. That when we believe in the death of Christ for us, for sanctification, in the shedding of the blood of Christ for us, in the cleansing blood of the Lamb, now, at that very moment of faith in the Lord for sanctification, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Look at now what we do in chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, we're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 12. It says, Wherefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people, the people he has saved, the people he has converted, the people who are adopted into the family of God, the people who have become his disciples, his followers now, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He's talking about his suffering on the cross, Outside the gate of Jerusalem, he says he sanctifies the people with his own blood. He says, now, now that we know there is salvation in Christ, let's go to him. There's sanctification in Christ, let's go to him. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp. Let us go, therefore, outside the world. Let us go, therefore, outside worldliness, outside the boundaries of the worldly people. It says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him, outside the camp, without the camp, bearing his reproach. And it tells us the reason why in verse 14. It says, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. He says, why do we get sanctified? Why do we go to him? And why do we allow the blood of the Lamb and the blood of Christ, the perfect, faultless, sinless, spotless Christ, why do we allow his blood to cleanse us, touch us, purify us, sanctify us? Because here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And we need that salvation. We need that sanctification. If we're going to have that life which is to come. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. It's saying Christ loved the church. What does that mean? Already the church is a called out people. Already we're saved and we're part of the assembly of saved, discipled people. And we have come out of the world, and Christ is still manifesting his love. He says, my death on the cross did not stop at making you come out of the world, come out of sin, come out of evil, and become a part of the called out people. He's still showing his love to the church, and he gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church. That he is for those who are born again. That he is for those who are saved. That he is for those who are forgiven already. That he is for those whose names are already in the book of life. The Lord Jesus Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for the church. Why? Verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse the church, every member of the church. Cleanse the church, every brother, every sister, in the flock, in the family of God, that he, Christ, the sanctifying Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. 
when that sanctification has taken place, what's the result of sanctification? Look at verse 27. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself. That he might present it to himself. When he saves, is to bring us to God. When he sanctifies, is to present us the sanctified vessel, the sanctified temple, the sanctified child of God, is to present us unto himself. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Sanctification makes the believer a glorious Christian. Sanctification makes the church a glorious church, a glorious assembly, a spotless assembly. And it says, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what sanctification does. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. We're saved, we're born again, we're children of God. The death of Christ has paid the penalty of our sin. And now that we're saved, we become new creatures in Christ. And we have the grace, we have the willingness to shun evil, all evil. And we can have the commandment to abstain from all appearance of evil. After that grace that is evident, that is visible, that is well recognized and known in our lives, because we shun evil, because we run away from evil, because we detest evil, and because we'll not have anything to do with evil, abstaining from all appearance of evil. Look at what God is going to do after that salvation in verse 23. And it says in verse 23, and the very God of peace, the God who has given us peace and justification, at salvation, that very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can he do it? Yes, he can. Yes, he will. He is able. And look at verse 24. In verse 24, faithful is he that called you. He's called you to salvation and you have responded. He's now calling you to sanctification because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and you are responding. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Number one, the death of Jesus Christ grants us salvation. Grants us justification. Grants us adoption into the family of God. Grants us forgiveness and freedom from all our external sins and transgressions. Number two, the death of Jesus grants us sanctification. And his word, his law, is reaching in our hearts. And he makes us to have the divine nature. And now we can live a life that glorifies him transparently. Number three, the death of Jesus Christ also smashes the power of Satan, the power of the evil one who held us captive in the past. Look at uh, number three now, the smashing death of Christ in Hebrews chapter 2. Reading from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, that's Christ, he also himself, that's our Savior, he also himself, that's our Redeemer, he also himself, that's our Deliverer, he also himself, likewise took part of the same. Look at this, that's through death, 
it might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, that he might destroy him, that is the devil that has the power of death, destroy him, the smashing death of Christ. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, and delivered them, all of them, and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. There are people that sell their souls, their spirit, their personality, their family, their destiny. They sell all that to the devil because they are afraid through fear of death. So they will not die. They join a cult. So they will not die. They go into idol worship. So they will not die. They come under the authority of the power of darkness. Who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. But now you can come to Christ because he died for you. And because he died for you, all that power of Satan and the authority of the powers of darkness, he smashes everything, he destroys everything. Actually, that's the first prophecy we have in the word of God in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, here is what God said after the fall of man, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, that seed of the woman, that's Christ born of a virgin. He will bruise the head of the devil, of the serpent, of the evil one, of the accuser of the brethren, he will bruise his head. That's why it's the smashing death when he died on the cross. And thou shalt bruise his heel. In fact, he tells us in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, blotting out everything Satan had had in, in plan. I will do this to him. I will cut his life short. I will destroy him. I will break his head. I will scatter his family. All the writing of ordinances that was uh, written against us, which was contrary to us, contrary to our progress, and contrary to our joy, and contrary to our victory, and contrary to our getting to heaven. All those ordinances, whether they are of men, of demons, of evil spirits, of the old serpent, of the devil, of the dragon, all those things that were contrary to us, look at this, he took it out of the way. Christ took it out of the way. Because Christ took it out of the way. The yoke, Christ took that out of the way. The handwriting of ordinances against you, Christ took that out of the way. Everything contrary to your progress in the Christian journey, Christ took that out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Nailing it to his cross. And then in verse 15, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in age. He has triumphed already. Look at First John chapter 3, verse 8. In First John chapter 3, verse 8, it tells us now what Christ has done and the result of his death on the cross of Calvary and that result in your life that result in your heart, that result in your character now. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. He has not met the Christ of Calvary, the redeeming Christ. He has not met the transforming Christ. He has not met the transforming and the saving Christ. He has not met the one that's matched the devil. It says, for the devil sinned from the beginning. Look at this, look at this. This is wonderful. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
that he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at, you know, the victorious declaration of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. He now declares because he died and because he's alive now, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And look at the victorious declaration, amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. That's what he has done. Number one, substitutionary death of Christ. Number two, sanctifying death of Christ. Number three, the smashing death of Christ. Let's come to point number two now as we come to Mark chapter 15. In Mark chapter 15, and we're reading here from verse 43. In Mark chapter 15, looking at verse 43, you see Joseph of Arimathea. He had been a disciple, but in secret. He appreciated Christ, but in secret. He, he loved Christ, but in secret. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. But now that he died, actually, he was to fulfill the scripture. Because the scripture had prophesied of this great honor. He did to Christ who died on the cross of Calvary. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God. He didn't allow his position in society to block out the view of the kingdom of God. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. It tells us he came and he went boldly onto Pilate and created the body of Jesus. It tells us in verse 44, in verse 44, and Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And in verse 45, it says, And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. There are three things we're looking at. Number one is burial after death. Is burial after death and this had been prophesied look at isaiah chapter 53 reading from verse 8 isaiah chapter 53 and we're reading from verse 8 it says in verse 8 he was taken from prison from judgment and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was caught off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, An image is grave for the wicked. You see, those two thieves that were crucified with him, it had been prophesied that at the time of his death, There'll be wicked people, sinful people, injurious people, criminals that will also at that same time die with him. And then it says, and with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea was rich. And then he asked for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he'll place that dead body in in some tomb, in his own sepulcher that he had cut out of the rock for himself because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And we're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 29. In verse 29 of Acts chapter 13, it says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, all that was written of him, the betrayal written of him, the arrest written of him, the questioning, and then the false witnesses, everything written of him, and also his quietness, he will not open his mouth to defend himself, everything written concerning him. 
and his crucifixion. He pierced my hand and he pierced my feet. He, all that was rich you know, of him. And then his death that he died on the cross of Calvary. It says, and when they had fulfilled all that was rich in of him, they took him down from the tree, from the cross, and they laid him in his sepulcher. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, it says, Wherefore saith he also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Verse 36. In verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But in verse 37, in verse 37, but he, he, Christ, he, our Savior, he, our Lord, but he whom God raised again. He rose from the dead after three days, after he had been buried. He saw no corruption. In verse 38 now, it says, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Christ, through this man, our substitute, through this man, the Lamb of God, through this man, our Savior, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. For starting, I give so the assurance, it says, and by him, all the believe are justified. All the believe are forgiven. All the believe are reconciled with God. All that believe are converted and saved. All that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. We have read now about the death of Christ. How do we come into this? As we are saved and we are born again, and then our sins are forgiven, and the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit in our heart that we're children of God by the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross. We now go into water baptism because Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That gives us the second session here, our baptism into his death. It tells us in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 3. Our baptism into his death. We identify with him in baptism. We identify with his death. It tells us in uh, chapter 6 of Romans, and we're looking at verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, identification with the death of Christ. That's why if you have not done water baptism, you ought to be immersed in water. But that's why also we need to understand Water baptism is not by sprinkling water. And it is not for infants, for little children who do not know about conversion, about salvation, about justification, and they do not know about the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is for those who have heard about Christ. They have known about Christ. They have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have put their faith, a definite faith, an active faith, a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a change in their lives already. And they have testimony. I know Christ died for me. I know he changed my life. I know he has now reconciled me unto God. It is after that knowledge, after that experience of salvation, and testimony and witness of the Spirit in our heart, we now go for water baptism. He says, don't you know that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized 
into his death. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Baptism, again, is not sprinkling water on the head of the one being baptized. We are buried inside that water. We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Here is the result now. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. In verse 5, it says in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, in water baptism, it's like planting, being planted together with the Lord Jesus Christ in the likeness of his death. When the farmer plants a seed, he doesn't leave the seed on top of the soil. He digs and he puts the seed inside the ground. Water baptism is immersion. Water baptism is by dipping that candidate for baptism into the water. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you claim to have been baptized in water, but it was infant baptism, that one doesn't work. That one is not scriptural. If it was by sprinkling water on your head and you were not immersed, you have not been baptized according to the scriptures. And if it is by making a sign of the cross on your forehead, you have not been baptized according to the scriptures. If you are born again, if you are saved, if you have been regenerated and you are sure your name has been written in the book of life, you'll go for real water baptism. By Bible believing, Bible practicing, uh, ministers of God who hold on to the totality of the word of God without corrupting uh, the word of God. It tells us in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10. Colossians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 10, uh, and ye are complete in him, uh, in salvation, ye are complete in him. Uh, is a sanctifier, you are complete in him, is a supplier of all our needs, you are complete in him, is a sustainer who makes us live victorious lives, righteous lives, godly lives, and you are complete in him, is all we need to take us to heaven, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, in whom also he has circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. He cuts off the Adamic nature. He takes off the depravity out of our hearts and is the circumcision not done by human hand. is made without hands in putting off the body of, of the seeds of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12 also reminds us buried with him in baptism. You see, everywhere you go and you think about baptism, you talk about baptism, it is burial, burial with Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the oppression of God who has raised him from the dead. Now, as we talk about this death and burial and resurrection, let's look at the third thing here, the believer's blessedness after death. The believer's blessedness after death. Uh, we need to understand, we have said this before, but maybe it has not really gripped you with real proper understanding that after the death of the believer, the blessed news and the blessed information that uh, enlightens us, excites us, is that immediately after death, we go to heaven. We're not sleeping somewhere. 
We're not hibernating somewhere. We're not roaming about somewhere. Look at Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43. Luke chapter 23, we're reading from verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, he called him Lord. He was on the cross. He was dying. This is the thief on the cross. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, even though I'm now on the cross and I'm dying as a criminal, as a sinner, he called him Lord. You are the Lord of my life. You are the Lord of my destiny. You are the Lord of my spiritual experience. And you are master over me now. If I had a chance to live, I will live under your authority, under your sovereignty, under your lordship. He called him Lord and he said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You are the king, the king of the Jews and the king of the whole universe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you are my lord, rule over me, rule over my heart. The little life that remains as I'm here now on the cross, rule over me and remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Verse 43, and Jesus, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Truly, I say unto thee, today shall thou be with me in paradise. His body didn't go to paradise. His body was taken down from the cross and buried. But his spirit, his soul, his real self, his inner man went to be with Christ in paradise. Actually, this was the first person to get to heaven immediately after the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And Christ said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. The moment a believer dies, that same moment he goes to heaven. Look at Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, we're looking at verse 22. Luke Chapter 16, verse 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died, look at this, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Immediately that beggar died, his body was still on earth, but immediately he was carried into Abraham's bosom by angels. And look at verse 23. It says in verse 23, uh, Lazarus, the second part, and uh, that the man who went to hell, he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Lazarus in his bosom. He wasn't waiting uh, for, you know, purgatory. He wasn't waiting for a number of years. He wasn't waiting for a century, a millennium. He wasn't waiting until Christ will come back before he got to heaven. Immediately a believer dies and his body is lifeless here. The spirit has gone to be with the Lord in heaven. Look at verse 26 there. In verse 26, it tells us beside all this, between us and you, there is a great God feels that they which will pass from thence unto you cannot. Lazarus could not pass from that paradise and from that Abraham's bosom and pass to the other side. And Lazarus could not pass from that place and come to the world. Uh, somebody has died. Uh, we saw him uh, somewhere else. We saw him uh, another place. No, not at all. After a believer dies, he goes to be with the Lord in a resting place of bliss and joy and happiness. And he cannot pass from thence to, uh, to there. Neither can they pass to us. That will come from this. Look at Acts of the Apostles. And we're reading from chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 7. We're reading from verse 55. It says in verse 55 about Stephen. But he being full of the Holy Ghost. Looked up steadfastly into heaven. 
looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And then in verse 56, it declares in verse 56 and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. The man was about to die. They were going to stone him. It was going to be a matter. And he was so wondering, is Jesus real? Is God real? Is heaven real? Am I wasting my life? If I'm stoned now, where will I be? What will happen to me? He said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In verse 57, it says, and Those people could not bear that. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. In verse 58, it says, In verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Look at verse 59. This, verse 59. This is the glory of it. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You already saw Christ standing. When Christ went to heaven, he sat at the right hand of the Almighty God. He sat at the right hand of majesty on high. As Stephen was about to die, he stood up to receive him to heaven. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. When a believer dies, immediately his soul, his spirit goes to heaven. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, Therefore, we're always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. While we're still here, and our soul, our spirit is present inside our body, we are absent from the Lord. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When our soul, our spirit is absent from the body, immediately we are present with the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Philippians Chapter 1, reading from verse 21, it says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I know not, I what not. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, For I am willing to for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be what Christ, which is far better. He says, I have a desire to depart and to be what Christ. That means when he died, he knew he was going to be what Christ immediately. The believer's blessedness after death, which is far better. We're coming to point number three now, the valiant discipleship of the Christian justified. We're coming to John, and as we look at John, we're reading from verse 38 and 39 and 40. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, been a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Verse 39. In verse 39, and there came also Nicodemus which at the first came to Jesus by night 
and brought a, mi a mixture of mire and aloes, and about a hundred pound weight. In verse 40, it says in verse 40, and the took that is Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, a ruler among the Jews, they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. We're reading this part for us to understand how we ought to be, how we need to be bold when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ is commendable. What Joseph of Arimathea did at this time is commendable. What Nicodemus did at this time, but we we'll still have a lingering question in our mind, in our heart. How is it all through the lifetime of Jesus, the counselor Joseph of Arimathea did not come out in the open and declare for Christ, I am a disciple of Christ? We we'll still have a lingering question in our mind. How about Nicodemus? Why did he come at night to the Lord Jesus Christ and he didn't declare openly that Jesus was his Lord and his Savior? He didn't declare his love when he was here, when Christ was here on earth. We still have a lingering question that after they had done all this burial and Jesus rose from the dead, remember, Joseph of Arimathea was still an honorable counselor. Remember, Nicodemus was still a ruler among the Jews. And then after the resurrection of Jesus, what was their attitude? Not recorded, nothing known about that. On the day of Pentecost, were they identifying with the, with the body of Christ, that is, the disciples and the children of God? Were they there? We don't know, nothing at all. But their story, we're learning something from their story. Number one, the cowardice of secret discipleship. If you're a secret disciple, I love the Bible. I love the people of God, but because of my family, because of my position, because of my profession, because of this, because of that, I cannot identify openly. You're like a secret disciple. And to be a secret disciple will not be enough when Christ will come. And then let's look at number one, the cowardice of secret discipleship. We're coming to that verse 38 again. It says in John chapter 19 verse 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, why secretly a disciple for the fear of the Jews, for fear of the Jews, for fear of the Jews. Well, there were a lot of people like him too. In John chapter 12, verse 42. John chapter 12, verse 42. The people who will not openly, the people who will not boldly confess Jesus Christ in the open, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Think about that. Jesus said, I leave your house to you desolate. I leave your uh, synagogue to you desolate because they rejected him. And what Jesus Christ had abandoned, the synagogue and their temple and their national worship and their tradition, what Jesus Christ said, I leave everything to you desolate, they were still holding on to that. And because of fear of being put out of the synagogue, that's why they could not confess him openly. We're told in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Proverbs chapter 29, we're reading from verse 25. It says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. 
the fear of man bringeth a snare. It's a snare to be a secret disciple and you cannot confess Jesus in your place of work. They don't know you as a disciple, as a believer, as a Christian. You are ashamed, you are afraid, and the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. The Lord wants us to confess him openly. He doesn't want us to be ashamed of him, to keep our position, to keep our honor, to keep our title, to keep a, an office. He doesn't want us to be ashamed of him. That's why he says in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, he says, so, so ever therefore, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, during this lockdown, there are many people that will praise the Lord. You'll be connected with us. You are hearing the word of God. You go to that family in that house church and you identify. You say, this is the word. I love it. I didn't know it was like that. As you have identified in the private, don't just be a secret disciple, a secret follower, a secret convert, a secret believer. Come to the open and let us identify together with the Lord Jesus Christ and let us profess we're children of God, we know the Lord, we're born again. Well, even if you have not done water baptism, it's part of your public confession. You'll do water baptism, you will not be ashamed of the Lord. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's come back to John. In John chapter 19, we're looking at verse 39. John chapter 19, we're looking at verse 39. This is talking about Nicodemus. It says, and there came also, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. He came now at the time Jesus had died. Jesus had died now and he came now like sneaking in. He sneaked in disciples. He sneaked in by night the other time. And now that, you know, the disciples were not around, and uh, all the leaders, all the rulers of uh, the synagogue were not around. He sneaked in again uh, and he joined Joseph of Arimathea so that they will bind or they will wind uh, the linen around the body of Christ and bury him, uh, the company of his sneaking uh, disciple. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're looking uh, at verse 1. In John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. It says in verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, he called him Rabbi, he called him teacher, he called him master, but in the private, when nobody could see him, he sneaked in a disciple. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, master, teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be was seen in verse 3. It says in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, assuredly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
the discussion continued until verse 12. And eventually Nicodemus went back home. It was in the night. And when it was day, he went back to Sanhedrin. He went back among all the other people. And he didn't show that he had been to Christ. Why would somebody be a sneaking disciple? If Christ be Christ, believe him and believe on him. If he's Christ, profess him and confess him and let people know that here is where you stand. You are a candidate for heaven. You are born again. You are a child of God and you identify with him in the public. Look at John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, we're reading from verse 48. John chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 48. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Nicodemus was there, and they asked a question. Anybody here among us rulers, among us Pharisees, anyone here that believed on him? Verse 49. In verse 49, it says, But these people who know us not the law are cursed. In verse 50, verse 50 says, Nicodemus says unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he came in chapter 3. In chapter 7, he was still one of them. And when they asked the question, as any of the rulers, as any of the Pharisees believed on him, look at verse 51. In verse 51, it says, Does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? He didn't say, Yes, I believe on him. Yes, it's my Savior. Yes, I'm actually born again now, and I want to declare to you the other night I went to him. No, he didn't say that. He just said, does our Lord judge any man before he hear him and know what he doeth? Verse 52, they were pointed now. They answered and said unto him, art thou also a Galilean? Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Look at verse 53. In verse 53, and every man went unto his own house. Nicodemus did not give an answer to the question when they put him on the spot. Are you one of them? They are from Galilee. Are you also of Galilee? And do you believe that this is the prophet of God and this is the prophet that is to come and this is the Lord and the King and the Savior? He didn't answer and he just dismissed the meeting. The company of his sneaking disciple. The Lord is saying, don't be like that. Don't be like that. In Revelation chapter 18, reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 18, we're reading from verse 4. It says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The Lord wants you to come out from among them. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, identify with him. It's not here now in the physical. Identify with the Bible believing uh, people, children of God, who meet together. And they're the body of Christ. There's a local church there, Bible believing church. There's a local church there, Bible practicing church. There's another local church there, the people who are born again and they worship God in spirit and in truth and they declare directly and they declare publicly we belong to Christ. Christ, identify with them. And once you come in, continue, continue. It says, number three now, our continuation was steadfast devotion. Our continuation was steadfast devotion. The Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 28, 
he wants us to continue. The joy of the believer is that we come to Christ and we continue. He says, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptation, in my trial. Ye are they which have continued with me in all my persecution. In verse 29, he says, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me. He wants you to continue, we will continue. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, reading from verse 40. Acts chapter 2, we're reading from verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves, deliver yourself, rescue yourself, separate yourself from this unto what generation. In verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Those 3,000 souls, they identified publicly with the church. They came with the whole, with all the apostles and the disciples. And they continued, verse 42, and it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in our prayers, COVID-19 is now subsiding and the Lord is calling us. Every member, you know, the Lord will protect you. The Lord will preserve you. Already we have been hearing the word of faith and we know not a minute, not a moment of our life will be cut short. He is a healer. He is a deliverer. He is a protector. So we're not uh, fearing what if I go to church or you go to market and you go to the shops and you take the bus and you take the taxi and you mix with your community even at this time and you do that every day and you spend hours in the market and you spend hours with other people. Now the church is gathering together. If you really love the Lord and you are waiting for the kingdom of God, this so the time to identify already you are part of the people of God. What a glorious time. Didn't you see how the worship is today? Continue like that. Continue like that. Like the other disciples continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and the Lord will grant you the blessing and the blessedness of an abiding disciple, a continuing disciple, a consecrated disciple, a committed disciple, a disciple that is waiting for the coming of the Lord. And when the Lord shall come, you will not miss out in Jesus' name. Nothing to fear, nothing to be anxious about, nothing to be worried about. Christ is our Lord. He is our Savior. Let's continue fellowshipping together. That is the will of God. Fear of man, fear of COVID-19, fear of this, fear of that. That's not the will of God. Let us put our faith in God. Let's continue worshiping together. Let's rise up as we pray that the Lord himself, the Lord himself, well, you know, be with us and the Lord will grant us the courage and the firmness and the commitment to keep on gathering together. Remember, Monday, we're meeting together. I was still accessing the message through all these uh, technical things. And then when uh, everything opens, make sure you are there with us in the local church on Monday. And then on Thursday, and our leaders, of course, on Tuesdays, and our workers on Saturday, and on Sunday, let us celebrate Christ and rejoice that we take part in all that he has provided for us on the cross of Calvary. The substitutionary death of Jesus, he died for you. He shed his blood for you, that you'll have forgiveness, you'll have salvation, you have redemption. He shared his blood for you that you will have sanctification. He'll purify your heart and then he'll purge your heart. He will give you the very nature of Christ. And remember, it's not just a saving death, a sanctifying death, it's a smashing death. He has destroyed the works of the devil because of what he has done. Then you remember Christ died for you and was buried. 
And we identify with Sehema in baptism, and we're buried in water to identify with the death of Christ. And remember, when a believer dies, his soul, his spirit goes into heaven straight. What joy, what glory, and what privilege we have that will belong to the Lord. And remember now the courage we ought to have. Don't be a coward sneaking into the church only identifying with the people of God in secret let your people know let your family know let people around you know I belong to Christ I have eternal life I am on my way to heaven and as we fellowship together let us continue let us continue and the Lord will grant you the grace and will grant you the strength I will grant you the courage of character and the strength of character and backbone to continue having and living with conviction all the days of your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we well, thank you and bless your name at this time. We know you are a great God and a mighty God. Thank you for surrendering Jesus Christ to die for us because you so loved us that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, because we believe. And as many have called upon you, as many as have believed on you, we pray, Lord, the evidence of that faith, the evidence of that conversion, and the testimony and the witness of the Spirit of God in every heart will be so real, will be so definite, will know without any shadow of doubt we're born again, we're converted, we're adopted into the family of God, we're reconciled unto God, and Christ by his death will bring us to glory. I pray, O oh Lord, your grace will increase in every life. The assurance will increase in every life and the boldness to confess you the boldness to stand for you and the boldness to continue with the people of God in real fellowship you grant to everyone in Jesus name we pray Lord will not look back we pray, Lord, we'll not just be secret disciples. We pray, Lord, we'll not be sneaking disciples. We pray, Lord, we'll not be fearful disciples. We will declare our faith and we will follow after you so that you will not deny us on that final day. Be with your people, Lord, and we pray, Lord, um, from today and then tomorrow, we'll witness about you. We'll talk to other people about our newfound faith a faith, a newfound joy, a newfound victory, and then on Thursday, we'll meet together, or maybe it's on Friday in some other places, we'll meet together and celebrate our faith in Christ, and then those of us who are workers or leaders, Tuesday, Saturday, Lord, unashamedly, confidently, courageously, and with a real conviction, we come together with the people of God, and then on Sunday, all of us, our families, wife, husband, children, father, mother, our parents, everyone. Lord, we come and we worship you without looking back and without being afraid of anything. In the presence of God, there is joy. In the presence of God, there is protection. In the presence of God, there is healing. In the presence of God, there is assurance. In the presence of God, there's preparation, willingness, and readiness for the rapture and for heaven. Heaven. We pray, Lord, all it takes to worship you unashamedly together with the people of God, grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Help us, Lord, not to look bad, but to keep on running the race until the very end. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.